Allow me to share a story with you that affected my life deeply. I was in the Ukraine in the early 90s. I had an opportunity to meet with a Ukrainian national leader who had been imprisoned under the Soviets for his nationalist views. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, he was now in a position of at being at the forefront of Ukrainian national revival. I sat with him and I asked him what appeared to be an innocent question. I said, tell me about your vision for a free Ukraine. He started by describing the history and he said, you know, we Ukrainians were oppressed by the Russians and by the Poles. The Jews collaborated with both and now we're free to be ourselves. I gulped at the comment about the Jews and I asked him to clarify, okay, but now that you're free to be yourselves, what does that mean? What's, what's your national vision for a free Ukraine? And he said, you have to understand, we were oppressed by the Russians and oppressed by the Poles, and now we're free to be ourselves. I said, okay, I get that, but can you elaborate a little bit more? What, what's the content of free being yourself, the freedom to be yourself? What does that mean? And he said, you have to understand, we were oppressed by the Russians and oppressed by the Poles. The Jews collaborated with both, and now we're free to be ourselves. I stopped to check with my translator to make sure that I understood him properly. And at that point, I shared something with him. I said, you know, I'm, as you know, I'm Jewish, and uh, I'll tell you a story that perhaps just relates to what you've just said, because perhaps you Ukrainians and we Jews have something in common. And I described to him a scene that took place in the early 80s, about a decade before, when I was a young rabbi in Toronto. I used to play hockey with a group of young men, and at the end of the season, we came to, they came over to my home, we were having a few drinks, and we had a discussion. They didn't realize I was a rabbi when we were playing hockey, and all of a sudden the discussion turned to things Jewish. And one of the fellows sitting next to me, he said, you know, Shalom, I want to share something with you. I said, what is it, Mike? He said, well, I grew up in a small town in Eastern Canada, and every morning, on my way to school, I'd confront anti-Semitism. I had to fight my way to school every morning because I was a Jew. He said, I'm really proud to be a Jew. I said, but tell me, what is it that you're proud of? He said, Shalom, understand, I, I had to fight my way to school every morning because I'm Jew, I'm a Jew. I'm very proud to be a Jew. I said, I, I get that, but tell me, what is it that you're proud of? He said, every morning I had to fight my way to school because I'm a Jew. I shared this story with the Ukrainian national leader and I said to him, you know, you Ukrainians and we Jews perhaps have this in common, that we've been spending so much of our history just surviving and trying to just make it to the next day as a nation, that the question of why survive doesn't even register. We don't understand, what, what are we proud of? I, I had to fight my way to school. What's the national vision? We are oppressed by all these nations. We're so caught up with surviving that the question of why survive, what's at the root of our own national vision is not easily accessed. We don't even hear the question. I looked at him, he looked at me and he, and he smiled and he understood. And then he turned the tables on me and he said, you know what? I see you've thought about this question. Tell me, what is your vision? What's your national vision as the Jewish people for Israel? What, tell me about it. And I felt for a moment, oh my gosh, I, you know, it was easy to ask the question, it's harder to answer it. And I looked inside and I asked him if he had a Bible. And he actually took from the top shelf of his bookcase an old Ukrainian language Bible, which had survived the Soviet regime, 70 years of communism. And he opened it and I said, please open to chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, and read with me those words. God said to Avram, to Avram, his name was Avram at that time, Go to yourself from the land, from your birthplace, from your father's home to the land that I will show you. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'm going to actually make you famous. I'll make your name great. You're going to be known throughout the world. And it ends with this phrase, be a blessing. And we're translating this together. 
And I asked him, frankly, what, what does that phrase mean to you? At this description of the Jewish people's future destiny, there's a statement, a few words, hey, bracha, be a blessing. And he said, I don't know what that means. What does it mean? And I quoted to him a commentary from Rav Shem Shemofel Hirsch, who says the hey, bracha is actually a kind of directive spoken to Avram as the first Jew for all the Jews in the future. Be a blessing. Most countries of the world, they try to establish for their citizenship to be the recipients of blessing, a good standard of living, a safe society, something that everyone will feel we're recipients of blessings. But the Jewish people are told not only to build that kind of society, but something more, to be the source of blessing to each other and ultimately to the world. The verses continue with, that there'll be a blessing that will derive, come through you, you Avram, and your descendants will be the source of blessing to humanity. And I said, this is what we read as the vision that was given to the first Jew as a national vision for Am Yisrael, eventually became Am Yisrael, the Jewish people. He looked at me and he said, this Ukrainian national leader, um, wow, that's too hard for us. Good luck to you Jews. It made an impact on me, not because it made an impact on this Ukrainian national leader. It made an impact on me because, for, in a sense, it was the first time I really asked myself to crystallize, in a nutshell, what is the national vision that the Jewish people have been entrusted with? And this statement is the beginning. It's the garin. It's the, the seed of what eventually became a mandate that the Jewish people received at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai, that was encapsulated in a, not only a, a vision, but a national mission that we were told in the book of Shemot, chapter 19, that we're going to become a mamlechet koanim v'goy kadosh. We're going to become a kingdom of spiritual leaders and a holy nation, a nation that is actually going to be formulated in a way and developed and directed in a way through this founding event at Mount Sinai to bring a light unto the world, to bring humanity to a recognition of its higher purpose. As a Holocaust survivor once put it to me, she said, the Jewish people have a specific mission in this world. All of humanity, every human being has a soul. The Jewish people were entrusted with a mission to bring out the soul of humanity. Now that's not an easy task, but it's something that we were given the Torah for, we were given uh, this revelation, national revelation at Mount Sinai, and through it, the founding mandate of how to accomplish that. Eli Wiesel, Zichrona Levracha, often compared modern Jewry to a messenger that got hit on the head. And we woke up, and when we woke up, we didn't remember, A, who sent us, B, to whom we were sent, C, what the content of that message is, or D, the fact that we are messengers in the first place. So this lack of awareness of these four elements is something that needs to be restored if we today, the Jewish people, are going to not only reconnect with our mission and reconnect with our sense of identity as messengers, but ultimately to fulfill it. So let's look at those four elements for a minute. First of all, who sent us? So our tradition is that the experience of Mount Sinai left its imprint on the Jewish soul, that there was a connection that was created with the revelation of God at Mount Sinai, that God himself revealed himself directly to the entire people so that each one of us would have an imprint on our souls of that connection and ultimately of the elements that we need to fulfill our mission. We've been sent as the covenant with Avram began, with God directing him to build a certain type of people, a nation with a higher sense of purpose, living in a certain way that would bring this light and identify the potential and, and reveal the potential that is within this world, within every human being. To whom we were sent? We were sent not just for ourselves. In every Siddur you find Thirteen Principles of Derivation of the Torah. The Svatimet takes this principle, one of the principles, and extends it to a beautiful description of the Jewish people's role in the world. It says that kol 
דבר היוצא מן הכלל, לא ללמד על עצמו יצא, אלא ללמד על כלל כולו יצא. Everything that goes out of the general principle, separated from the nations, he said, the Jewish people were separated not for ourselves alone, but rather to bring something to humanity. The Nitziv says that the Jewish people have what he calls the koach v'achiyuv l'ashlim et ha'olam kulo. That we have both this power, the potential, and the obligation, the ability and the responsibility to bring the world to its fulfillment. Tikkun alam, something that will unite all of humanity under a, a vision of what is possible, of the potential within the human spirit for peace, for love, for the unity of humanity, fulfillment of a relationship with a higher purpose, a fulfillment of a relationship of love and peace amongst each other and with God. And that recognition we received at Mount Sinai, that imprint on our souls that we have this drive to bring about this perfection, tikkun, correction, to repair the world, is something that has been planted in the Jewish spirit and continues to live itself out 3,300 years later in all sorts of ways. How do we ground this How do we unite the Jewish people's efforts of tikkun olam in something that's really grounded in our founding mandate, that really brings us back to who we are? We have this founding mandate. It actually appears in the form of the Aseret HaDibrot, the Ten Commandments, something that is, is famous throughout the world as the foundation of Western civilization, as the moral and ethical foundation of those that care about tikkun olam. And the Jewish people were given this 3,300 years ago as the founding mandate of our national mission. So let's look at that for a second. We've now taken who sent us, to whom we were sent. We were sent by God to the whole world. For what, what's the content of the message and what does it mean about our identity? So let's talk about identity for a minute. I tell you a story that happened to me, again, in the 90s. I was traveling with a young Russian, young, young man, originally from Belarus, from Minsk, Vitaly Prus. He and I were traveling, speaking to people about a program in, for Russian Jews at that time in Belarus that he had begun. We were traveling from the United States to Canada, and at that time, in order to cross the border, you had to fill in a specific form which you still do, but at that time it had a, a line on it which asked you for your nationality. I'm originally from Canada, I filled in Canadian. Vitaly wrote Jewish, like it's written on his passport under the Soviet U Union. Judaism, Jewish identity is a national identity. So he wrote nationality, what's my nationality? Jewish. I said, Vitaly, um, that's not going to work. Uh, you have to write Belarusian. Belarusian? He looked at me like I was out of my mind. I'm not a Belarusian, I'm a Jew. Now he grew up with any, out, practically no Jewish education as the Soviets had outlawed any teaching of Torah, of Judaism. But he knew that he was Jewish from his family, but also because it was stamped on his passport as his national identity, national identity in Russia. Under the Soviet Union, Judy, being Jewish was a national identity. I tried to explain to him in, in North America, it doesn't work that way. You, you know, Jews are not uh, Jews, they're Canadians and they have a Jewish religious identity and national identity, they don't know what that means when you talk about, it doesn't apply to Judaism. And he said, what are you talking about? That's who we are, aren't we? Aren't the Jewish people a nation? And of course he's right. So you, it's interesting how this raised for me this dichotomy that we have seen for the last many, many decades, perhaps centuries, that in different parts of the world, and today you could see it in the sense that North America, Jewish identity is a religious identity. But we know that being Jewish is something more than that, but it's basically you fill in the line and form religion. I had to fill in the line when I was growing up, even if I didn't practice Jewish religion, what's your religion? Jewish. In Soviet Union, what's your nationality? Jewish. Okay, he asked me what mine was Canadian, you asked him what his religion was, he didn't have an answer for that because he was raised in an atheist regime. Now we know that these two dimensions of being Jewish are parts 
of something higher. They both derive from something that happened at Mount Sinai and happened before. When we look at what it means to have, what is the content of this Jewish identity that we're talking about, it has a religious element. It has an element that says, of course, there's a content of the religion of Judaism. But it's more than that, because even if a Jew is not religious, he's still a Jew from the national dimension. But the hybrid of these two elements, the synthesis, is in fact something much greater than both of them. At Mount Sinai, we were given a mission as messengers. We call it a brit. It was a covenantal identity that was forged at Mount Sinai, that this messenger status, we were to fulfill that. We were given both the content and the forging of identity and the covenant to fulfill a mission for humanity. So, of course, that requires a certain national identity, identifying with that being the carriers of this message. And at the same time, it, there's the content of the message that needs to be understood, which is the content of the religion, the content of the concepts that we've carried, the practice, the mitzvot, all of that is contained in ultimately the message that we took upon ourselves to live with and to bring to humanity. So if we look at that section, what does it mean to be a messenger and what did we forget and what do we need to restore? It's a, it's, it's a challenging question today because there's all sorts of elements of Jewish identity that don't really speak fully to that, that don't appreciate the significance of that. And that's part of our challenge today, is to restore an understanding of what, what it means to be a member of this covenantal destiny called being a member of the Jewish people of Am Yisrael. And finally, the content. The Aserat brought were given to us as the founding mandate of this covenantal destiny, of this mission. And in that regard, we need to examine why these ten statements. In the Hebrew, they're not called ten commandments. They're not Aserat mitzvot. They're actually Aserat HaDivarim in the Chumash itself. In the Torah itself, they're called the ten statements, the ten utterances, if you will. We refer to them today as the Aserat brought, but they clearly are not just ten mitzvot alone, as Rashi points out, and we have from our tradition. They contain all of the Torah, all the 613 mitzvot are contained in the Ten Commandments. And at the same time, they represent the tamsit, they represent the essence of the entire mitzvah structure. As the Rambam puts it, they're the <coughs> ikar hadat, the essence of the religion, Vereshito, and its beginning point. So it's, it's the founding mandate, if you will. It's something that gives us a window into the entire Torah. At the same time, it gives us the foundation upon which both everything rests, and it gives us an appreciation of what the foundation elements are. What are the Yisodot? What are those foundational elements that we are carrying? How do we engage the Torah in a way that gives us the proper foundation for fulfilling this mission. The Aserat Dibor were given for that purpose. They were given for the purpose of giving us the values, the character, the vision, the appreciation of what type of character we need to build in order to fulfill a mission for ourselves and for humanity of ultimately being this source of blessing that was given to as the, as the founding directive to Avram Avinu, the first Jew. Abraham, the first Jew. So let's just speak for a few minutes more about the content and what it means. So these 10 statements are varyingly called the 10 roots of all the mitzvot, the 10 foundational elements of the whole Torah, the, the 10 klalim, the 10 principles upon which one can see the entire structure of all of the Torah. I want to suggest a, another phrase that speaks to our generation, core values. Core values is a term that's used in many different places today. It's something that speaks to us because it ultimately is asking us, who are we? What, are, what do I stand for? What are my core values? What, when I look inside to my core, what do I see there that really is me? Not peripheral, not outside, but actually within me. What can I identify as the core values of my own life, core values of my family, core values of my community, core values of my nation? Can I identify them? Have I thought about it? If you take a few minutes to think about 
and ask yourself, what do I really stand for? What are the things that when it comes right down to it, I wouldn't compromise on and that form the elements of my core identity, who I am? How do you discover your core values? It's really important to look deep inside and say, what is it that makes me tick? What is it that I deeply see as who I am? The deeper we go, the deeper to the core, we actually discover that our core is connected to something very deep within us, our soul, our soul identity, the values that in fact are a reflection of the core of all of existence, the core of creation, our connection to God through our souls. And the deeper we look within ourselves, the deeper we find those values. And they're not surprising in the sense that they contain the things that we all want. We want to be happy. We want to be helpful to each other. We want to be compassionate. We want to be loving. We want to be respectful. We want to have a relationship that builds family. We want to honor the past and our parents. We want to respect God and have a relationship with God. We want to have a sense of purpose and fulfill with clarity why we're all here. All of these things are contained in one, or one way or another within ourselves when we look deep enough, and some more, some less. But take the time to look in and see what are your core values. And I think you'll find, as you go deeper and deeper, that there's an imprint on our souls, on every one of our souls, that actually is reflected in those 10 statements that were imprinted on stone and given to the Jewish people to give us our core values, to give us a framework, to give us an understanding of what we are inside and what we're striving to live with in order to fill this specific mission that the Jewish people were entrusted with 3,300 years ago. But it's not enough to have a national vision. Of course we need that. And in modern Israel, where the Jewish people have, we found our way back, the Almighty's brought us back to our land to give us the opportunity to build a modern state and we've created an amazing, amazing modern state where six million Jews have already returned. And to build that nation with a vision that dates back 3,300 years ago, that the foundation of the values that we were entrusted with then and given then actually speak to all of us and to all of humanity is a very exciting dimension of rediscovering the power of the Ten Commandments, that they can form the basis of a renewed national vision for the state of Israel, because they are inclusive. They are both old and relevant. They are both personal and national. They're inclusive, but very specific. They're Jewish and universal. They're simple and deep. And if we rediscover that potential within the Aseret of the Ibrahim, we truly can discover not only a national vision, but something that really speaks to us from within. It's not something imposed from without. It's something that we find deep within ourselves, within our hearts, within our souls. And when we feel that and discover that, it's an amazing revelation, revelation from within. The most important revelation that we can have is that which we already believe in, we already know, because then we trust it and we want it clearly as an expression of who we are. So the expression, the Ten Commandments, the Aseret Dibrut, are the core values of Am Yisrael, is both a statement speaking to the totality of Am Yisrael, but perhaps most importantly, it first speaks to each and every one of us to look inside, discover how it speaks to us, study it, unravel it, to really look deep inside ourselves and deep inside the Ten Commandments to see how we can reconnect with this beautiful and powerful set of core values that is ours. It's our treasure, it's our gift, it's our opportunity.